Hi, this is Manny Howard. Welcome to Salon Talks. Today my guest is Jose Andres, whose new book is Vegetables Unleashed. Jose Andres is a chef. He's also the time, he's also been named Time's most influential man, I'm sorry, person in 2012 and 2018. In 2018, um, you were, among other things, on stage at the Oscars, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you're the, uh, you've uh, been awarded the Humanitarian of the Year um, by James Beard Foundation. Yeah. You have 31 restaurants. Yeah. Um, you're an educator. Um, you um, run a organization called Think Food Group. Yep. Um, you're an advocate and a proud immigrant. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And I am so proud to have you on as a guest and to talk about Vegetables Unleashed. Thank you for having me, Manny. Really <laughs> happy, happy to be here. Happy to be here. Thrilled to be here. <laughs> um, the book is great in a lot of ways. It's, it, act, it just talks about you. Um, it talks about well, um, your, your co-author, Matt, um, does a great job of talking, helping you talk about you. The, right? the Matt Golden, he's like a Jedi of words. Uh, actually, the best part of the book, yeah. forget the recipes, is the amazing way he is able to, to write. Yeah. Uh, this is not m my book. This is very much his book. Yeah. Um, he gets so involved and he's able to not only tell my story, but the story of my team members, the story of many uh, unknown farmers. Um, he's been giving voice to every single vegetable and somehow he's able to translate me. So <laughs> he's like a Jedi of writers. He's the Yoda of writers. Yeah. Well, it's a, um, it's, a, uh, it's a fantastic book. And the way, one of the ways it starts that I love is that um, one whole page is dedicated to boiling water and ways that people, um, because so many vegetables are cooked in water, um, a lot of people just throw a big pot of water together and throw the vegetables in, but you want people to do it a little bit differently, right? Well, but, but it seems like lately uh, water and vegetables, they are like a big no-no, right? Mm. All the recipes is about roasting or yeah. grilling or sautéing, which actually is fine, is great. But I always remember when uh, my mother and my dad, both nurses, uh, they had to feed my three brothers and I, and sometimes they didn't have enough time because working, busy lives, uh, four, four children in the family. And my mom will always have this little pot of water. And we'll always have a lot of vegetables because we will go very much every day to the little vegetable uh, yeah. store, we call it in Spanish, La Fruteria, right. that we had in our little town. So whatever was in season, very much is what you will find. Mm, broccoli, cauliflower, green beans, asparagus. And my mom used, will add salt into the water. Um, she'll have the florets of cauliflower. She'll put it in. She'll put them in the, in the water. Two, three, four, five minutes. Depends because me, I like them crunchy. My brother, right. he like it softer. So she will move the cauliflower, remove the cauliflower from the water before for me, right. a little bit later for my brother. Olive oil, yeah. cherry vinegar. And I remember that moment, that cauliflower in my mouth being an amazing moment. So I think sometimes we need to be bringing those uh, forgotten techniques right. that we seem not to like, like boiled vegetables, sounds so bad. But to me, boiled vegetables are sexy, are good. It's the best way to bring the flavor of the vegetables forward without spending a lot of time in the kitchen. So that's why I want to use to make the point that boiling vegetables is actually the beginning of a great meal. Right. Yeah. Um, and another thing you, met, you mentioned is don't use too much water because the water that you boil the vegetables in is a tool as well. And that's, yeah. I mean... Uh, you get the water, not too much. You put enough salt so the flavors get... They, uh, they penetrate in the... The salt penetrates in the vegetables. Also gives this very beautiful green color. The chlorophyll pops up. Right. Uh, but also, specifically, true. You don't need to use so much water because why would you waste it? Right. But then, don't throw it away. If you think you're gonna be boiling more vegetables tomorrow, just keep it in the kitchen. Right. It's okay, the water is good. Yeah. If one day you're making a stock, 
tomorrow with the leftover vegetable scraps, as I tell in the book, use that water right. to boil more vegetables. And then you can have a beautiful vegetable stock that can become a soup itself, right. or you can use it for any cooking you want. You can even boil pasta on that same water and all of a sudden, believe it or not, that pasta is going to be even tastier. Right. So, yes, treat that water with respect. We need to be using water in a smarter way on this DNA. Right. And this will be a smart way used to be using water in ways that is going to make our lives right. uh, smarter in the way we cook, but also tastier. Right. It's delicious and good for the planet at the same time. You got time. it. Right. Um, Actually, your story about your um, about your mom's cauliflower reminds me of my grandmother used to cook beans, um, string beans, uh, green beans. She used to run them through a tool that would stri would pull them into four to make the long, slices. The, the yeah. long slices. Yeah, and gone for me from my childhood in England until one day I came across one of these tools, and it looked it was exactly the same tool that my grandmother used, and I started using it, and I haven't stopped, and it's completely changed the way. Um, it, it's I, I so greens. many utensils out there that can make your life very easy around vegetables. Yeah. That me, I tell everybody, you should be buying every time you see a new utensil that makes yeah. your life easier around vegetables. Do it. Yeah. Like to pit the olives or to pit the cherries. Right. Yes, to do the long strips of the uh, green beans if you don't want to be using a knife. To right. peel the apples in the same moment that takes the core of the apples and slices the apples. Yeah, yeah. It's so many machines out there that is great, not only for you to make your life easy in the kitchen, right. but also to bring your kids, your husband, right. your wife, your right. friends, and make sure that the moment in the kitchen with vegetables is always a fun moment. Fun. Right. I'm still working on fun, and I'm a very bossy kitchen person, so I'm still working on having the rest of the family come in. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm I'll let them tool the beans. Uh, if my children are watching, I'm probably they're watching this, <laughs> you know. Uh, they will say, yeah, you're very bossy too, daddy. Uh, so, okay. We, we I let them tool the beans. We though. need to Come be to less bossy. Yeah, I know. Well, it has to be right. That's my thing, but, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. but, yeah, yeah, bossy. We are bossy, <laughs> sorry. Um, and in the book, you also cover a great range of vegetable uh, vegetables, you, you know, uh, and preparation. I mean, you have every pretty much every vegetable that I can think of in there, and you also focus a lot on uh, Asian vegetables, seaweed and, and yeah. things like that. Um, but w one of the elements in the book is that you have very esoteric, fancy um, like, you know, carrots as spaghetti, right? And you have, yeah. um, but you also have a mac and cheese that's made for the microwave. Oh, yeah, I, I think we did the one probably like a cacho, a pepe, but with corn, I think. Right. This was actually my daughter that was like, daddy, daddy, Look at what I found in the computer. Actually, she was already cooking it because she likes pasta. Right. And so sometimes even after we all go to bed, she goes down and she makes her own little dish. Right. And, and <laughs> if I go down <laughs> the kitchen, I may find her almost with the entire house in darkness. And she's right there yeah. uh, with her uh, iPhone light used uh, <laughs> With cooking. music in there, and right? She, and, yeah. she had, and she had this kind of uh, <laughs> recipe that she said, look at that, with very little water and in less than two minutes, I can be cooking the pasta, and then right there, you don't use more water, you just add the cheese, you can add the corn, you can add anything you want, right. and in this case, the oil, and you can add black pepper, and all of a sudden, you have a great pasta. Yeah. So very much uh, that idea of the recipe was through my daughter that she got the inspiration through different recipes on the, on the big World Wide Web. Right. So it's amazing <laughs> that in this book, again, it's not my recipes. Right. But it's the recipes of my wife, of my children, of my team members, of Matt Golding, of so many people. Right. That that's why this book is not used about Jose's vegetables, but the way I see the world right. enjoying their vegetables. Vegetables through Jose. Yeah. Because yeah. you have a joy of cooking th thing in here about uh, corn cakes, right? Yeah. Those yeah. are the corn, the corn fritters probably is what uh, make me fall in love with the joy of cooking. Yeah. I own a first edition of uh -huh. Irma Rombauer, and... Um, the, the first edition was so, so tiny compared yeah. to the one that is right now, which yeah. is entire, well. you know, entire yeah. encyclopedia. Yeah. But one day you say, so the value of that uh, was probably a recipe three lines long only. And right. there was very quickly, yeah. use the corn kernels, make sure a little bit of corn starch, a little bit of egg whites, a little bit of egg yolk, right. a little bit of salt. Yeah. And that's it. And there you had those amazing fritters with olive oil. Right. Almost like a quick pancake, right. um, but, yeah, but quicker and, and faster. Right, faster than pancakes. So, so yeah. I fall in love with those 
right. uh, corn feeders. And very often in my house, in the moment that we received the first Maryland um, corn, oh, like the oh. silver corn and right. others, yeah. the first thing we are doing is the corn feeders. Right. right. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, and that's what you did, is you went home and you said, let me look in the joy of cooking for a corn recipe. And yeah, that's great. It's um, so many old books that sometimes they are the inspiration of what is going to be your next favorite dish. Right. That's why I always go to books, especially yeah. the old ones. Right. And you have thousands, right? Well, it's a great many. picture in here. Yeah. You yeah. covered in books. Like well, uh, knowledge is everything. <laughs> uh, and I can tell you, I would like to tell you, I know everything, chefs. Yeah. <laughs> we think, everybody thinks we know everything, but it's so little we know. Yeah. The only thing I know is that every time I know more, I know I know nothing. Right. And it's, it's, it's true. Yeah. Well, yeah, stay hungry in that, in that yeah. regard. Yeah, you have to stay hungry. As I'm growing older, I, I realize you that the world is full of things we yeah. don't know. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to share through vegetables some of them in this book. Right. And, you, and, and you're very aware of, you know, the state of vegetable cooking and the state of meat versus vegetable in the book, you, you know, you, you, know you, you, you describe yourself as coming from a ham, from a pig culture, yeah. and that it, you know, it took it, it takes some energy to get from the pig culture to the, you know, to a focus on vegetables. Uh, yeah, uh, but the, the truth is that if you go, for example, the country I come from, Spain, yeah. very much vegetables is something you will find more in the markets, uh, but then at home. Uh, restaurants in the old days used to be more meat-centric or fish-centric, um, and almost vegetables, very much like in America right now, vegetables, they seem they are always on side dishes. Yeah. And I thought that was the moment to start bringing vegetables front yeah. and give them the importance they should have in the way we feed ourselves. Right. In my house, the vast majority of the meals are vegetable and, and, and fruit centric. A lot of legumes, a lot of lentils, a lot of chickpeas, and every single vegetable, root vegetable you can imagine. Right. Meat, I love meat, my family love meat, fish, but we realize that every time we feel better every time we, we eat less of it, but right. better quality of it. Right. And so vegetables, we have a little garden outside. So the idea for me was, uh, what can we do to put vegetables forward? So a few years ago, I opened a fast food restaurant called Beefsteak. Right. Beefsteak is a fast food restaurant that even the name is Beefsteak, is 99.9% .9 vegetable. Right. And this was uh, for me to make a point that we all talk about vegetables are necessary for a better world, for a healthier population, right. for, but that vegetables, they really need help to be put out there, right. because people want to eat vegetables. America wants to eat vegetables. The world wants to eat vegetables. But sometimes we make it very difficult right. for them to access vegetables. Huh. Right. And, and and was this a was this a is this a new thing for you? Is this a two year old project? Is this a, no? Probably we opened beef steak like four years ago, and yeah. now we have like seven, eight, something like that. Right. But I mean, at home, the 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 sort of making pushing vegetables forward, making uh, we've just started doing it at my house, uh, making trying to make meat the the condiment. Uh, uh, or the, the garden. Yeah, the, the side right? dish. Yeah. Uh, no, in my house, I would say that because my wife, um, vegetables, they've been always, quite frankly, part of our diet. Right. Uh, in, the, in, in the book, I have, for example, gazpacho, which is the, the tomato soup of south of Spain, where my wife comes from, right. Andalusia. And it's one recipe that probably everybody in America has it by now because it's been published many times. Even here, I'm giving a new version, right. and my wife has been the one always pushing gazpacho right. in our family. And in my refrigerator, you will always, even in winter, when on paper you don't have the best tomatoes, you will find gazpacho in the refrigerator, right. especially in summer. Imagine, think about it, it's a liquid salad. Uh. Gazpacho is used the tomatoes, but it's blended. Right. All of a sudden, you don't need fork, you don't need knife, you don't need to be using your teeth. You grab the pitcher, you serve yourself a glass, and you're drinking an amazing tomato salad yeah. that has been transformed into a soup. Yeah. 
that's the kind of the spirit of this book. And you have a cabbage gazpacho in here too, right? You're saying use the yeah. juicer, make the, you know. A juicer, I know, for some families, maybe something like it's kind of expensive, mm. but then everybody seems to be having an expensive iPhone or expensive <laughs> tool that barely we use. Spend your money wisely. But <laughs> if somebody should spend money in a good way, it would be a good juicer. Yeah. Because when you get some carrots and you get some, in this case, the red cabbage, and you don't know what to do, go to your user yeah. and just use that. And that liquid on its own is amazing. Yeah. If you add some vinegar and some oil, 2.0. Yeah. If you add more oil and more vinegar, it becomes a dressing. You can make a soup, yeah. you can make a drink. All of a sudden, you can make a dressing to toss your salads or the same vegetable where that juice comes from. Right. All of a sudden, the leftovers of making the use, some people throw away garbage, some people, like in my house, you do composting, or you use it to make a fried rice. Right. You see, everything yeah. in the vegetable world technically can be always reused. Right. It's not something we can say from the meat world. Right, right. Whereas meat, meat once you've done it, you know, it's cooked and you gotta, well, I guess you could put it in your corned beef hash. And the vegetable, like the amazing thing is that the entire holistic circle of life, 360 degrees, always happens. I, I see it when I've been doing the composting in my house for many years now. I'm very lucky that I have a little house outside Washington, mm. and I have a little garden, and I have an area for composting. And it's great to see that instead of throwing the yeah. vegetable scraps uh, garbage, it's we go and well. we make composting that then is helping me to grow my asparagus or whatever is what I'm planting. Right. Also, I use, like we have in the book, we use the scraps sometimes to make a stocks. Right. You see, this is a good way to be right. using the caldo, the right? composting to yeah. be vegetables right. into a caldo of vegetables that sometimes is used great broth. You add a little bit of salt, then you can add any other vegetable after they are finished, uh, potatoes, some pasta, right. and right there you have a great broth, a great consomme of right. vegetables that somehow they were about to be thrown garbage. Right. It's a very smart way to be used. Right. Um, and so, so some people are talking about um, uh, um, the need to eat non-meat, and they're talking about the Impossible Burger. They're trying yep. to create a. They're trying to create a <coughs> burger, that, a meat that isn't um, yep. uh, um, as um, harmful to the environment as yep. as, uh, as <coughs> traditional beef is. You have a great um, riff in here about the Impossible we Burger. <coughs> With Matt, we brought this essay and we wanted to put thinking in the process because it's, I'm very happy that we are addressing that already in this book because yeah. something is happening. Every single fast food company right now, as we are speaking, they are incorporating that new product into their menus. So the question here is, can we produce uh, a protein uh, that comes from the vegetable world that somehow uh, has the mouthfeel and behaves umami like, too, right? and the umami, but that behaves like almost meat. Uh, what we call, we can call it fake meat. Me and Rob prefer that, uh, you know, to call it that this is another form to be using vegetables to come up with a new product right. that can be part of our diets. Not any different than tofu that we make out of the soy right. <laughs> milk yeah. that we are able to coagulate with a little bit of heat. At the end, anything that is to create more vegetables or things that come from the vegetable world, I think is very smart. We need to be obviously looking. When you see a carrot in the farmer's market, 99% sure that that carrot is good for you, is good for your community, is good for your children, is good for, right. for the land. Uh, when we see foods that they are more processed, uh, we only need to be looking at to make sure that nobody is doing anything that may not be good for us or the world we live in. Right. But right now, as I say on this essay, I believe that we need to give a chance to these new right. companies that they are trying to bring uh, a new product forward. Right. Uh, it's one that I love, which is called Just X, right. which, um, or Just Scramble, which is almost this, again, this uh, vegetable kind of protein uh, that behaves like X. Right. And you can do an omelet, right. uh, and I think it's brilliant. And I've been watching that company from the very beginning and use anything like this to have, in this case, less animal products. I think it's always very smart. Right. So um, we need only to be giving a chance to those companies to be part of who we are. But at the same time, we need to be asking those companies to be very open in the way they produce those ingredients, right. the way they produce. 
So if we you're going to grow meat, we don't, we don't want to be supporting something like at the end uh, becomes uh, or ends being worse yeah. for us and the environment than actually the problem they are trying to solve. But on paper, I will say I'm giving them the benefit yeah. of the doubt because I think the products are very good and hopefully they are producing them in a, in a good way. And um, is this get, is going to be good for the world. Does it get you in trouble with the GMO people? And the no, I, I think the GMO people is another conversation. Yeah. Uh, we need to understand that we've always tried to modify vegetables, meaning if today we have the type of vegetables we have, it's because somebody has modified them by what we call more natural techniques of bringing certain carrots, putting them one with each other, and at the end creating the perfect carrot, or the same with every other fruit right. or every other vegetable. But this has been done in a more uh, traditional way, like. Husbandry. Uh, but then when sometimes you use other mechanisms to change completely almost, I would say, the DNA right. of a product, there is something we always should be alert because we want to make sure that one day something like this doesn't create more problems than the problems they're trying to solve. Right. So again, uh, it's a lot of good people trying good things, uh, but I only want to make sure that somebody for their own personal uh, company interest doesn't create something like we are sold into something like looks like the future right. and the best thing for everybody. But then one day we wake up and it's like, oops, hold on a second. Right. This is not as good as... Right. We were growing meat on a hook and now... That's what I think <laughs> we need to maintain a level, a good level. We need to have a small farmers and yeah. support them. Right. We need to have mid-sized farms. We need to have the super big companies. But we need to make sure that we give the same, uh, the same opportunities to everybody. Right. It cannot be that the big, big super farms receive uh, um, uh, incentives from the farm bill right. and subsidies, but then the small farmers no. producing carrots and, 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 and cabbage and cauliflower, they get none. Yeah. We need to make sure that um, our farm bill and our politics support the big, big industry, right. but they don't forget the little ones. Right. The little ones, they should receive the same or even more support than the very big companies, because this way we will make sure that the world has a chance to eat the best we can and make sure everybody will always be fit. Right. There's a great section in this book talking about who gets, you know, what um, uh, through the political process, and 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 you and you take time out of the book to introduce people who you've met um, in your travels who are doing you know great things for you know, um, and you uh, have many profiles of them. One is uh, are the folks at Chef's Garden. Um, and which is a, a great organization that brings people in and teaches them about you know yeah. what's possible and what's changing and sort of cutting edge vegetable stuff, um, and that's in Ohio. And then there's a play, then there's a guy there's a guy who has a garden called the Gangster Garden, um, who eked out a small plot in South Central and it. The um, Gangster, yeah. Yeah, and it struck oh. me that. Um, uh, he got arrested for doing it. At yeah, some Mr. Point, right? Mr. Friendly, he's yeah. a legend in LA and around the world. Some of his TED talks are legendary. Yeah. But this one guy that sees uh, producing your own vegetables as a way of, of freedom. Yeah. And he he believes that there's a lot of people that live in areas of America and in the world that they are food deserts. Right. That they don't have an option to eat better. Right. And that to eat vegetables is actually like a luxury. Right. Because people have to get on a bus and on a subway to get to a faraway uh, market. Yeah. And he's saying, why we don't start creating in these forgotten communities in America and around the world uh, gardens that people with no a lot of resources can have access to the same yeah. fruits and vegetables that anybody in the richer parts of America or the world have. So he's like a fighter of saying, uh, we need to have the same opportunities for good quality food as anybody else. Yeah. So really he's a food fighter in every sense of yeah. the way. Yeah, it struck me that like, you know, a, a great place like Chef's Garden is about education and Gangster Garden is about education and self-defense. That they, they, totally. You know. she, Chef Garden probably is a farm of, of farms. Uh, yeah. they, 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 don't, they don't care so much about the seeds or about the vegetables as they yeah. care about the soil. Uh -huh. Nobody has engineered the soil better than the great exactly. people of uh, the chef's garden. That, yeah. Every single vegetable has its own quality soil. And when you see that soil through the microscope, you see that that soil is full of life, yeah. full of 
little tiny insects yeah. that all are enriching the soil where the vegetables come from. Yeah. A good vegetable, we need to remember that if it's very good and very tasty, is because it comes from a very healthy and rich soil. Right. Soil is the key to great vegetables. Not like with that, I'm not saying that hydroponics should not be also a right. way to the future. But that water also has to be very rich in nutrients. Right. So nutrients are key for successful Wherever they are. farming. Yeah. Uh, more traditional ways, like taking care of your soil, which is still we need to take care of our soil, but also new technologies that is allowing certain parts of the world that maybe they don't have access to that rich soil to also produce good harvest. Right. And, um, and one of the places, you've always been involved in this stuff, and one of the places you really drew the world's attention to the problems of food insecurity um, was Puerto Rico after Michael, mm -hmm. um, which is an ongoing project. Um, I'm hoping you could update us and tell, first of all, tell us what it was like going well, in. I know you've told the well, story. Uh, but uh, Puerto Rico happened, Maria, just, we were coming from a long season of hurricanes. Uh, I remember myself, I was using Houston and other places, and Puerto Rico heat came big. Right. We landed and we saw that the problem was even bigger than what we saw on TV. The entire island was without electricity, right. without gas, without telephones. Nothing was working. I'm, I'm not talking one or two days, we're talking weeks at the time. Yeah. So very much the supermarkets got empty, people ran out of food in their homes, with no phone, no gas, people couldn't communicate, people couldn't travel, it was total chaos. And what we did very quickly was just making sure that we organized the team and any food was available in the island to start feeding anybody that really was desperate for a plate of food. And was there food? And there is always food, and yeah. especially in America. Yeah. What happened in a chaos situation, you had to organize the teams to make sure that you were able to gather anything that was available until n new shipments were arriving to the island. Right. But initially it was plenty of food. What was not is the system in an organized way to bring it to the kitchens, to cook it, and then to have a good distribution system to send it out. Right. What we did in World Central Kitchen, we almost did over 4 million meals. Um, we were more than 25,000 volunteers. We opened more than 26 kitchens. We were feeding almost 100, 150,000 people a day mm. and delivering food to more than 923 places per day, oh. every day the same. So as we move away from that uh, disaster, and as the island began many months later, just coming back to normal, World Central Kitchen changed modes. And for the last uh, year, we've been investing in farms. Okay. Uh, Puerto Rico imports more than 85, 90% of the foods they consume, right. and that cannot be sustained any longer. Right. We began investing in small farmers that were closing and leaving the island, and we told them, we want you to stay, and if anything, we want you to grow more. And we had this plan that by the year 2012, uh, uh, 2020, 2021, we will have more than uh, 240 farms all across Puerto Rico, uh, helping Puerto Rico fit itself right. to make sure that we bring down the number of food they import and hopefully we can bring it to a more logical number. That's what we are doing to bring food security to right. Puerto Rico. And that's true of a lot of you know, uh, islands in the Caribbean um, is that there is no, like I have, a, I have a friend, Josh Eden, who opened Jean Georges' restaurant in the Bahamas and they had yep. all their food flowing in every day, FedEx. And it's super expensive to do that. For example, Dominican Republic shows us that it's a way forward. Uh, Dominican Republic actually imports uh, much less. I think they only import 30, 40 percent of the food compared to Puerto Rico, almost still 90 percent. Yeah, yeah. Still a lot, but they yeah. still produce 60 percent, which is actually a no bad number for an island. Remember, islands don't have a lot of land compared to other parts. Right. Uh, in the continent, uh, so that's not a bad number at all. But I think, I think we need to make sure that places like the Caribbean, uh, but then everywhere, that our communities, that's matter where you live, have easier and quicker access to foods. Right. I do believe that we have to have bigger control on the foods we eat. And this means having food production closer to where we live. Right. The, cities of, the yeah. food, cities of the future have to change. We have to bring, yes, the places we live, be happy and buildings, but then we need to be making sure that we have water sources and foods being produced not too far away from where we live. So we don't have to be transporting food from thousands of miles away. The, f the cities of the future will make sure 
that farm and food production is happening right where we live. Right. I do believe that's the kind of cities we will see towards the, uh, this next coming century. I was going to wrap saying, what's next? How are we going to do this? And, and that's, that, that's the answer. I mean, we, I think we have daughters the same age, and my daughter is very concerned, I'm guessing yours is too, about all the climate change reports that are coming out. The well, they're real. Stuff. Yeah. They're real. They're happening. I'm a scuba diver. I see what's happening under the water. I see you watching my computer yeah. on the last 10 years alone, how the water temperature is increasing. If I go back 10 years, oh. I'm scuba diving. Alone? scuba diving in Cayman Islands, yeah. and I go today, I can see that already the temperature is I got two or three degrees higher in the same. That. So yes, we need to be doing something about it, but I think we need to remember a phrase from a Frenchman, and usually I don't quote Frenchman <laughs> in the open so easily, <laughs> but this guy was in 1826. Uh, his name is Briat Savaran. Yeah. He wrote a book called The Physiology of Taste. He's the guy that said, tell me who, what you eat and I'll tell you who you are, but he had a, he had a more important phrase. He said, the future of the nations will depend on how they feed themselves. I think it's about time that in the political discourse, our presidents to be, our congressmen, our senators, start bringing a food talk forward. Our politicians right now are not talking very seriously about the food we eat, right. how we produce it, how we make sure that everybody has access to it, and this needs to change. If we want to have a good America, a great America, if we want to have a great living world, we need to start thinking more in how we feed the world. With that, I'd like to say thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Uh, great Money. pleasure. Yeah, great <laughs> pleasure.